Interesting talk from Travis. By day, he's a CT, a ch chief director, you said? Uh, just a director. Just a director. <laughs> director Technical <of> director. <laughs> um, by night, he makes amazing music, codes away, does cool stuff. Hi, good morning, everyone. Welcome to PyCon, and welcome to my talk on uh, Python and how it's used in the, uh, in the audio and uh, music industry. Uh, yeah. Uh, as heard, I'm a, a technical director at a company called Span Digital. We're based out of Cape Town and San Francisco. So, yeah, during the day, I uh, obviously focus in on the Cape Town team. And during the night, when I used to do music, I now have to deal with the time zone in, in America. Um, yeah, my career has, has just been supported and driven and uh, just shaped by Python. Um, it's a great community. Um, so, yeah, everyone that um, you know, contributes to the language and to the libraries and, and to the open source uh, projects. It's, yeah, it's, it has been amazing. So my second career or hobby is, is this. It's uh, music and DJing and, and producing live. I've been in the industry for about 16 years as a coder and about maybe 10 to 12 years as a, as a DJ and a live performer. And I've I've had the honor of performing at some of the top events um, in and around South Africa. That's not me, <laughs> alas. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> uh, yeah, so this is uh, my, my music partner Wayne on the left and myself on the right. No gray hair yet, this was before the birth of my daughter. <laughs> and yeah, I think there's maybe five or ten people on the dance floor. <laughs> So this is our setup. Um, some of it is, is, set, is set up here today. Um, uh, what we're doing actually is uh, most uh, performers will only work on audio. So they'll, like now, they'll jack into, um, into a sound rig. And what we're doing here is we're actually controlling both the video and the audio. So the laptop on the left is plugged into the, the, all the, the, I suppose, like the projectors that you have here that are uh, speckled around the, the party and then my laptop uh, with my two these are my older controllers with my sound card is um, plugged into the rig and the two laptops are connected as well so if I'm working with sound and I add a delay that instruction actually goes through to to the other laptop and then uh, Wayne can actually <coughs> import that delay into his software and he can make you know something happen on on the visuals so, yeah, so this laptop on the right is uh, running VDMX. I might show a little bit of it today. Um, so that's driving all the visuals. Um, that's with his controller, my laptop, another, <laughs> another laptop, and then the current artist that's performing. Um, it's a bit of a st stressful setup. You know, you, if you walk behind the DJ and you, you, you're trying to, you know, stay under the performer, there's just thousands of cables. So. You know, one wrong move and you know, you're either going to kill the entire party or drop the sound and you'll have a couple of thousand people, yeah, not too happy with you. So, you know, what makes this all happen? Um, at its core is MIDI. <laughs> I don't know how many of you people remember MIDI. I can give you an example of something. Uh, let's just do this. Remember this stuff stuff? Okay, that's from, does anyone know? Yeah, 95, 98, and, and 3.1. So when most people think about MIDI, they think about this cheesy, uh, horrible synthesized music that, that comes out of a computer, but it, it's definitely not that. Okay, so MIDI stands for Musical Instrument Digital Interface, um, and what it does is it allows you to have devices like this, or keyboards, or audio effects units, and allows them to send signals to a computer, and for the computer to send signals to the device. Uh, most commonly, it's a notation, so if you're playing on a keyboard, you've got a keyboard roll. As you work through the, the notes up and down, each one of those signals is being sent to a computer. And it's not just the note that you're playing, it's the velocity of the key, um, if, you, if you're bending the pitch, uh, anything to do with your uh, musical performance, all, that, um, all those instructions get sent to the computer. 
Another thing that MIDI is used for is for sending control signals. It's called a control change message. And that's things like volume, uh, vibrato, panning. And if I'm tweaking anything on this musical instrument, well, this controller, it's normally a control change message. Uh, of course, you need to keep all these things in sync. Um, I, my project here is probably running at a certain uh, speed, beats per minute. And you obviously want to send that information through to the device because the device is, um, might have some sort of rhythmic setting or an arpeggiator or something like that. You obviously want to keep them all in sync. So MIDI message is um, it's quite simple. It's, it's been around for, for yonks. Uh, it's basically got a, a status byte which shows what type of message it is. Is it a note on, note off, or as I was talking about, a control change message. It's got a channel setting, which is 1 to 16, and it's got one or more data bytes. And the data just controls what type of volume you're, you're basically passing through. So uh, touched on it a bit earlier, MIDI is not just used for, for DJing and for mu music equipment. Um, this protocol has been adapted in, in many other areas. So ob obviously in this scenario, um, I'm going to show you some of it on how the audio works, but it, it also gets used in VJing and lighting. So you know, you go to a party, you see these lights turning on and off or changing shapes. It's basically all driven through MIDI. OK, so this is uh, VDMX. It seems complex. <laughs> it's not too bad. But what it's actually doing is it's overlaying um, different video streams. Uh, kind of what we do as DJs or, or music, we're, we're laying different sounds. Uh, you can do the same thing with this software. You can see it's picking up on uh, audio analysis, so it's using the mic. And I can actually use that to affect filters, which will drive things like how bright the image is or uh, that type of work. And then, of course, MIDI will come into this. And everything that you see, the, any bar that's moving or any uh, visual component, you can basically right mouse click and go assign to MIDI and you can control it from, from a controller like this. This is an audio controller, but if I hold down two buttons and I hold shift shift, it converts it into a, just a, a basic MIDI um, controller. All right, so that's um, it's pretty old school actually. <laughs> this is a, a MIDI cable. I don't have any. I don't have any here. Um, you'll see there's three ports uh, in, out, and through. Um, basically, it's I suppose it's like a token ring network. You can daisy chain devices. So um, this device will, uh, if it's assigned channel one, for example, this device will pick up all those messages and use them. And anything that's not channel one, it might just pass down the down the cable to the next. Um, the next device. These days, uh, MIDI, the actual port is gone, so even though I'm running on MIDI, um, you get a USB, so if you look at this device, I'm actually, I've got a USB plugged inside it, but you've got to plug at least, you've got to plug at least one device um, in through a USB to have it perform, so yeah, this guy's actually not doing anything. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so all right, control, and, and yeah, I'd actually, there's a lot of performers out there that often just press one play button and, <coughs> and that's that, and they'll be twiddling knobs and do nothing. So controllers, so a controller um, these days are amazing. They're, they're multifunction, um, and they can handle context. So add a device similar to this. It's really nice. You've got a matrix uh, of buttons. The buttons have different colors, and depending on the application that you tie with a controller, you can assign different sections of the matrix to different things. So if I'm in a session view and I've got a whole lot of audio clips and I'm, I'm busy playing and stopping them, that can be my, um, my session view. And if I load this up against an instrument, something like a drum kit, um, you know, I can assign each button to a different drum, like a kick or a snare or a, or a hat. If you're uh, an engineer with a bit of a design edge, uh, nothing stops you from designing your own controllers. Um, I see this quite a bit in, uh, in the industry. Um, I mean, MIDI is so simple, and I'm going to do a bit of a demo with Python on, on how you can work with these messages. But this is a good example of a homemade controller. If you're not a designer and an engineer, 
don't create your own controller. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I, I, I see this quite a lot as well. There's people that take products that, that you buy for, you know, um, an Xbox or a, a PlayStation or something like that, and then they'll retrofit it because basically this is a MIDI controller. Um, it's got sensors on it. You know, it sends a digital signal down the cable, and you can you can basically get MIDI out of it. Um, a lot of artists take old toys uh, that have got old 8-bit uh, sound, and they use that. They retrofit them and they they pull that into their uh, into their performance. Does so anybody know who this is? Yeah. Daft Punk, yeah. So this is their uh, pyramid, and it's a combination of uh, MIDI devices, um, audio, um, and yeah, it's, it's basically all intertwined, and that's how they perform. They basically can drive anything uh, and everything from, from the pyramid. And that's what a, a, a studio, a home studio, looks like. Um, I've, got a, I've got a few friends that have, okay, maybe not to this degree, um, but yeah, a lot, a lot of the home studios now uh, have everything that you need to, to, uh, to produce world-class music. All right, so let's get into um, some code. Okay, so I've just um, I've got a, a little virtual environment set up, um, and I've imported in uh, Mido. Mido is a Python a Python library for working with MIDI, and I've pulled in other li uh, uh, two other libraries, which I'm going to demo a little bit later, which is uh, OSC and Open Sound Control. So the first thing I can do from Mido is I can um, request it to go and have a look at all my MIDI ports and report back um, information about that. So I've got two devices. Um, I've got uh, Touchable, which I'm going to show you now on my iPad, and I've got my tractor, my tractor controller. So I can uh, load up the MIDI input of my tractor, and I can... I can basically print out um, what I'm doing. Oh, sorry. Sorry, live has stolen the has stolen the port. <laughs> sorry about that. Okay, sorry, it's not connected. I, f I figured with the setup something has to go wrong. So uh, what Mido does is it basically, um, it's a, it's a built-in MIDI monitor. So if you're touching or working, oh, that's what's wrong. It's not in MIDI mode. Okay. So yeah, if you if you work with a device, um, yeah, any any modification that I made to the device, if I twirl a, a knob or I um, uh, adjust a, a lever, um, what it does is it uh, sends a MIDI uh, message to my machine, and basically what it stores is, as I said earlier, the type of note, um, the value and its number. You'll see it on the right. So this is a mapping of the device that I've got on the, on the, on the table. Um, I've got two decks left and right, and in the middle I've got a, a mixer component. So uh, bottom right, I'm, I'm going to do a little bit of work uh, later on with the play button in the corner, but the play button in the moment is a control change message. It's got a number of 10. You'll see it's listening on channel 1. And if it receives MIDI, it's going to uh, update the LED so it can set the LED, the play button LED, on and off. Um, and at the moment, the color is set to green. So um, MIDI is obviously the, the, the base protocol that's used, um, but there's another one called Open Sound Control. Now, Open Sound Control is 
has the same function as MIDI, but you have devices, uh, especially things like iPads, where you want to leverage the networking capability of the device. So it's quite a nice protocol. It's very, uh, it feels restful. Um, you know, it uses a full URI. It's got paths, um, and you can attach uh, arguments and stuff to it. Um, you, you can um, send a number of arguments in one message. Uh, so yeah, it's just the next and up-and-coming um, protocol. And often what happens is uh, um, I'll run a uh, OSC server. It's a UDP-based server that I'll run on my laptop. And I would run it in a bridge mode. So that software would accept um, OSC messages. And then it uh, converts it to MIDI. It'll register up a virtual MIDI port. You saw um, that touchable port that's virtual. It'll register a virtual MIDI port. And it'll send MIDI instructions down, down that channel. And the library, there's a few OSC libraries. The one I'm going to show you today is just called uh, Python OSC. <coughs> All right, so I've got. I've got a little server running. Um, I import a dispatcher. I import its OSC server. Um, I gather some arguments. And I register up a new dispatcher. I map a path uh, or an address slash BPM uh, to a function called get BPM. At the moment, I'm just going to print out the args. Um, so it's just it's a pure listener. And then, yeah, you'll see it spins up a threading uh, OSC UDP server, parts the IP import, and maps it to the, to the dispatcher. And the client's pretty simple. It's got a, a OEC message builder and a UDP client. Same thing, gather some arguments, um, spin up the UDP client, and I use the message builder to build up the BPM address. I add an argument. For now, I'm just running through a, a loop, and I'm sending it a, an integer value for my BPM. And I just yeah, send those messages via the client. Okay, so you can see the UDP server is picking it up. It's running through OSC. Um, it's deserializing the message, and I'm just printing it out um, on the screen. So it's very, very basic, very basic to work with. Okay, so I'm just going to run through another demo. There's software <coughs> running on this iPad. And what I'm going to do is spin up, I'm going to spin up Ableton again. That was interesting. Hello. <laughs> All right. Okay, so this is the software. I'm just going to relink it up to Ableton. Okay. So uh, on my iPad, I've got a software running. It's called Touchable. Um, it's connecting to bridge software that's running on my laptop. And sorry, the screen is really resolution is really small. But anyway, I've got a number of uh, I've got a number of channels. Um, <coughs> So you can see uh, what it's doing is it's connecting to the bridge. Uh, the bridge is sending um, is connected to my audio application, and you'll see that the application is running. You can see the application is looping, and yeah, I can basically um, 
drive audio. And I can control the software from here. So the channel that I'm, I'm working on is, I've just spun up a little drum channel. Uh, let me just show you the button. Okay, it's got a couple of modifications that you can make. Yeah, so if you look through this now, let me just go full screen. There's, um, at the moment, because of the instrument channel that I'm on, it's mapped to a drum, so... Yeah, anything that I interface with on the device is sending messages to the bridge, the bridge to the application, and it's sending it through to my application. So you can drive quite a bit from this. And yeah, this is how most people, uh, when you see people DJing these days, this is kind of how it's done. Um, and yeah, it's just all, I don't want to say it's as easy as, as point and click, but... Yeah, so that's th three channels. Uh, I can change loops, I can adjust uh, frequencies, I can, yeah. Uh, and obviously I can make it more and more, more and more complex. Okay, so that's uh, touchable. Plug this in. <coughs> Sorry, it is a, a bit of a, a complex setup. I hope you guys don't mind. Okay, so the application that I'm showing you, what is it? Thanks. It's a uh, digital audio workstation. It's basically an IDE for musicians. It allows you to manage MIDI and audio and video. There's a whole lot of them out there. I uh, don't know if anyone recognizes Fruity Loops. It's been around for I don't know how many years. <laughs> it's uh, similar to similar to the serial, um, and it's just it's just been re-released. There's now a, a Fruity Loops Studio that came out last year that seems to be doing pretty well. So yeah, Ableton. One of the reasons why I like it is it uh, allows me to do, do live work, and it's still got the old school sequence sequencing. Um, it's got the really nice uh, matrix that allows me to do, if I'm recording music, I can just uh, uh, adjust and um, you know, bring in clips, art clips, and see what works. But the most important thing is it has a Python interface. Uh, so what you can do is when you're setting up your MIDI devices, um, underneath the control surface, you can map it to a device. If your device is not there, you can set up your own. So what I've done, this is a proprietary application uh, controller for native instruments. What I've done is I've created a little uh, tractor folder, I've got a little init.py file, and I've registered up a class called uh, Tractor Control S2, and on one call create instance, I just return it my, uh, you know, my object, my control service object. Um, they give you this live object mod model, which is quite cool, so each one of these things is something that you can work with and, and uh, interface to. <laughs> and basically it allows me to customize how this thing talks to the application. All right, so this is my, uh, ignore the flake 8 warnings. <laughs> um, I normally disable E501, by the way. I hate the AD limitation. Uh, all right, so this is my, um, my tractor class. Um, basically what I do is um, I spin up my deck one, I spin up, spin up my deck two, I've got a mixer controller in the middle. As the app spins up, I register transport components. So at the bottom of my, um, my device, is a set of buttons. And so all the buttons upside down on the top are what you're looking for. So I've got a play, cue, sync, and shift. And what I can do is just using that uh, controller editor, I can have a look at the CC number. Um, I register it in as a button. Um, obviously, in in Python and engineers, we start from zero and not one. So, uh, channel one to sixteen, <laughs> zero to fifteen. So I register up those buttons, and I 
uh, set up a session, um, I stop all the clips, I set the stop button, and I take this folder and I copy it into the, uh, the Ableton's MIDI remote folder. So what that gives me is, there's my controller, I've mapped it to my input field and my output field, and if I do anything now, oh, you might not see it, but it's basically um, where this would only be a dull controller with no lights, I can now uh, send many messages to it and I can drive it as a, as a proper button. All right, I just want to f uh, finish up my talk on the last section, which is audio streaming. Um, I had a little bit of fun with this a, a few years ago. Um, uh, just uh, basically did a prototype to see if open source uh, work could, could spin up and work as an online internet um, radio station. So there's a whole lot of application clients, uh, streaming clients that you can use. I'm not going to go into depth, but basically what it does is it... Um, basically pulls an audio interface, converts it into a stream, and can sub, uh, post that stream up into something like Icecast, for example. So you guys can uh, Google those. Some work better on Mac, some for uh, open source or Linux. Um, and yeah, some have a lot more like Mix, which is uh, almost an open source DJing tool, but it allows you to stream as well. Yeah, at the heart of streaming is a really cool programming language called Liquid Soap. Uh, what it allows you to do is, is manage streams. Um, for example, uh, on this one I have a playlist which has got a whole lot of music. Um, I've got a couple of jingles that, or adverts that need to be played. Um, okay, I just load up a, a default streaming channel. Um, and then you'll see as I set up my radio station, I want to play four songs and then randomly and thereafter play one jingle. Four songs, one jingle. Four songs, one jingle. Uh, if anything fails, if for some reason the, the streams drop, you can fall back to a, uh, a channel that might just play a repetitive, like Talcum on hold music. Okay. This is really nice. So if, if you've got a, a live DJ and he's talking and for some reason that the mic goes dead or something, you can uh, automatically fade him out and bring in uh, a song of some, some kind. So Icecast whew, has been around for a very, very long time. Um, it's extremely stable, um, and it just allows you to, to basically run a stream, and you can have multiple media players connecting to Icecast and, and stream your, your live uh, audio. Uh, Airtime is an application that basically wraps all these technologies. So if you don't know how to spin up Dark Ice with Icecast and Liquid Soap and, and get into the programming side, there's a company that's uh, open sourced it, and, and you can run... Uh, airtime. Uh, at its core, it's unfortunately PHP based, but at its core, its services are all Python. So it's a play out liquid soap and its media monitors all written in, in Python. It's a really nice, it's got a really nice interface. Um, so you can load up your tracks, you can do scheduling, um, you can have different shows, and yeah, you can see when you're on air, and it's got a whole source management uh, which handles how streams uh, come into airtime. That's kind of what it looks like. So you can have a, a master source that comes in that's always playing, and then if a show is scheduled between 10 and 11, you can actually give permissions to another DJ somewhere else in the world. You give them the ice cast details. And as the show starts at 10 o'clock, it'll enable that uh, username and password, and that DJ will be able to override the source. It'll come in as a show source, and then that DJ can work within that time period. And once that's done, um, the master source will switch back on and uh, music will play. Um, the playout's quite nice. It, it, uh, if you import any media files to, uh, to play on airtime, it'll run through, um, make the sound you know, at a certain gain. If there's any silence in the front at the end of the track, it can clean that all up. And um, it'll have a look at the file and make sure that the tagging is right. That Mutagen is also a Python, uh, Python software. All right. Thanks very much. Cool, thank you. Uh, does anyone have any questions? I see you've used Python a lot to play music, but how 
Matthew, have you looked into using Python to create music? To create? <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's an interesting question. So a lot of these uh, library, uh, there's a few uh, directions that you can go. The one is uh, you can uh, use something like Mido um, and just code in algorithms to pass it through to device and get it to play. I mean, that's the one way that you can do it. Another way to do it is there's a lot of work around um, audio, uh, like DSP units. Um, and that you actually, you're not working with MIDI, you're working with sound. So you're actually sending it like what a synthesizer would do. You, you're actually generating the sound. It's very complex to do. Um, I've done a lot of uh, synth work where you layer, where you start with nothing. You layer uh, sine waves, saw waves, square waves, um, and just with shifting of pitch, you start. Um, and frequencies, you start working with each of these sounds and creating something. Um, there's a thing called uh, attack, decay, sustain, release. It's basically how you describe sound. So a kick will have a, a fast attack, a short sustain, and a very short release, where um, a piano with the foot pedal down will have a, you know, a much longer sustain and, and uh, release. And that's, yeah, it's very, very hard to do from a, a math or a, a coding point of view. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> oh, right. So um, I'm assuming that not all DJs are software developers. No. So um, how does this compare to, you know, how a DJ without these skills would do it? Yeah. Got it. So um, what a DJ would do. So the, the most of the stuff that I've shown you. Um, like MIDI, for example, a, a DJ is not going to go and try and go into a controller code and, and write MIDI. So if you look at this application, I can put it into uh, MIDI map mode, um, and I can select on a knob, I can touch a knob on the device, and it'll, it'll assign it automatically. So a lot of the applications have auto MIDI mapping capabilities. But the problem with this is, I mean, it, it's great, and um, when, when I'm working with some of the other controllers uh, that have this pre-written interface, I don't have to worry about it. It's, it's, it's good enough to allow me to perform. But what it doesn't do is some of the more advanced stuff around the application itself. So, you know, if, if I push one button with the Python software, I can ask the application to do many things. So it's a little bit more, uh, it just gives you a little bit more control. Um, so I have a question. Um, is it possible to do sort of live performance coding with of music with Python? <laughs> uh, probably. <laughs> I don't know if I would uh, risk it at a, at a party. I mean, yeah. If uh, you know, these parties are extremely stressful. Um, you know, all the music that we play, we, we don't um, we don't just DJ other people's music um, and have. You know, often DJs you'll see they DJ one track into another. You know, what we do is we produce the music, we keep the elements separate. So while we're performing, if we find the crowd's not responding as much as we wanted to, we can pull out a kick drum and put in something else, or, or change the percussion a little bit, or add effects units, um, or effects. Um, so it's, it's, quite, it's quite complex, and to get that right, even without coding, is, is something. Um, on the VDMX side, I mean, there's other ways of coding. Um, on, if you're doing something on, on visual, there's... Um, uh, within VDMX, Apple has uh, Quartz. I don't know if you guys know Quartz, it's the, the graphical engine of Mac. You can basically write uh, programs that create shapes. But same thing, that's, that's, it's, it's a bit of coding in math, but that's done before the party. And then you basically save up that object. You can pull it into something of like VDMX, and then you can tweak its structure <coughs> or its shape or how it's spinning. Yeah. Do you know if anyone has done kind of um, machine learning on DJing to try and see how the crowd responds to certain uh, MIDI commands? <laughs> That's quite interesting. Um, so, so there is a, not a machine learning, but um, there's quite a bit of work that's done on um, human emotions to tone and to keys. So certain, if, if you write a track in a certain key, you're going to get a certain different response from from the client, uh, oh, from the client. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> so from the user, from the person at the party. Um, I know I would love to see that study uh, combined with, yeah, with something like machine learning and just there, there's 
hints of it on the internet where um, you get a party that's there's no DJ uh, and the, the music's playing and um, just depending on the vibe or the, the beat they've got cameras everywhere and measure body temperature and, and all sorts of stuff so yeah you can google it there's some, there's some interesting stuff happening but <laughs> it's not something I'm gonna get into <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Alcohol intake and <laughs> cool. Ah. Um, what's been your experience in terms of integrating live analog instrumentation into your performances? Have you done any of that sort of thing? Yeah. So. Um, Many years ago, <laughs> when I was young and naive, um, the, the parties that we would play, we would actually have analog synthesis, uh, number one, so that's the first way of doing it. It's still a bit digital, because you're, you're working with the synthesizer, but you'll often find, uh, I've got one or two friends in the industry that, that do very, very well, and uh, there's artists like, um, yeah, one of the ones that I follow that I love is a Hybrid, and what they do is they've got full drums, full guitar, full everything, and all that gets um, mic'd up and recorded into the software. And then the cool thing about the software is what it'll do is on the fly, it's another reason why I like um, live, is it can quantize and fix, um, you know, if I'm playing the keyboard and I hit a key slightly late, uh, the software itself can pull that key and, and get it back on beat. Um, so there's a lot of, yeah, all these applications can do that. If someone's singing and they're slightly off tone, um, you have these uh, auto tuners or correctors that can fix the voice on the fly. So there's a lot of cheating out in the industry. It's just it's something that happens. And um, yeah. Okay. Um, unfortunately, we've just run out of time in our very delayed program that we have today. Um, thank you very much, Travis. That was absolutely fascinating. Super. Thank you very much. Um, just a few housekeeping announcements before we go to lunch. <coughs> Uh, later on today, there's going to be a machine learning open space in the Liesbeck room. So if you're keen, go through. Um, we're handing out Piconza t-shirts after the lightning talks today. So if you want a shiny, cool t-shirt, please make sure you're there. Um, we're going to be uh, starting the session again after lunch at quarter past, no, quarter to two, because of how late we were earlier this morning. Because we're delayed, please be, uh, be here as soon as possible so we can get kicked off quickly. Um, after, otherwise, go to lunch. Get something to eat. <laughs> <laughs>